Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 27th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explained that while after the spring revenue forecast the legislature has started to intensify the fiscal debate, their knee-jerk reaction remains to continue spending and protect the top 20%. Second, we discuss why there's a disconnect between the legislature's fiscal approach and the conditions actually facing Alaska families in the economy. And third, we discuss the beginning of some recognition of the impact of PFD cuts on Alaska families in the Alaska media. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, the weekly top three, I mean, it's like uh, we were just saying during the break, uh, all of a sudden people said, discovered that, whoa, wait a second, we've got a we've got a revenue problem. Wait, I I had no idea after after 15 years of excess spending from savings and and deficit spending. I had no idea we had a revenue problem. I mean, I'm shocked, shocked. I tell you, it's insane. Yeah, it's the when the spring forecast came out, it was uh, it was humorous. Uh, to see all the people's reaction, all, all of the legislators' reaction about, oh my gosh, I mean, there's a there's an issue that we have to that we have to confront. It's right. like they had it had. It's like they hadn't been following uh, oil prices or production levels or the Michael Duke show <laughs> for uh, for the for the past six months. So um, I, we're we're finally at the point where we can sort of start the meat of the session. I guess uh, we've got the we've got a realistic revenue projection out in front of the legislature, and the legislature uh, can finally start dealing with it. So your first number one of the weekly top three is the legislature's knee-jerk reaction. Um, uh, so what 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 makes you say that? Give us the give us the rundown here. Well, here here's the re- reaction since the spring revenue forecast is has has gone out. Um, there have been some who have said, "Oh my gosh, we're spending too much. We need to rein some of it in," but not many. I think Mike Cronk yesterday in in House Finance. Uh, amended a, a proposed uh, spending of 1.5 million on something down to 1 million because oh, we have a we have a we have a re- we have a revenue yeah, problem out right, there we right. have a, we have a fiscal problem out there. Uh, there's all of the pressure that's been behind increased spending is still out there uh, in the Senate finance presentations of the spring revenue forecast. There was oh my gosh we got a problem. But that problem, you know, still doesn't factor in that we're going to increase school spending, we're going to increase the, the BSA, uh, and that we're going to have defined benefits, and that we need to spend uh, we sp- we need to spend on other things. So, part of the knee jerk has been has been, oh, yeah, we got a problem. Maybe we need to pay attention to spending a little bit, but we're still going to spend more. And so, what we really have is a revenue problem, and the and the reaction on the revenue side has been disappointing. It's been, well, we need to cut the PFD even deeper. We need to we need to use a head tax, a regressive head tax, the most regressive head tax in the nation, even more uh, in order to uh, address this revenue problem. Um, and then Bill Wilikowski's come up with oil taxes, which are we need to address oil taxes as part of as part of the overall uh, 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 fiscal fiscal response. Um, you and I have talked on the show, even the Department of Revenue has come out and said there are oil taxes that we should be kept collecting that we're not, that wouldn't have an impact on production. So Wilikowski came out um, with oil taxes. And then Ben, as you were describing earlier, came out with the sales tax, uh, 
Um, and, you know, sales tax is less regressive than PFD cuts. Um, so, you know, for somebody to say <laughs> PFD cuts are the, alt, are, the, are, the, are the ultimate source of revenue, uh, the marginal source of revenue, sales taxes would be less regressive than PFD cuts. That's better uh, than, uh, than PFD cuts. So for somebody to say Ben's a rhino is just sort of ridiculous. I mean, Ben's right. trying to improve the situation from the baseline. Uh, which is PFD cuts, but sales taxes are still regressive. Right. Um, so, so let's look at what let's look at what the response has been. Little cut in spending, very little cut in spending. You know, sort of. Uh, we'll shave off at the margins, but not much. Oil taxes and sales taxes, which are which are which are a regressive form of tax. Who's not in that equation? Who's being left out of that equation of that right. of that overall equation? The top twenty percent. So we we we've, we've got a situation in which oh my gosh, we've got a problem um, uh, that we've got to address. Let's just keep shoving it off on middle and lower income Alaska families. Let's keep using regressive. Let's not cut spending. We don't want to do that. Let's keep you. Let's let's make even deeper PFD cuts and let's maybe use sales taxes at the margin and and let's go get oil taxes, which is which is a good thing. But oil taxes aren't affecting the top twenty percent. So. What we've got, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to continue down the road that we've been going down, which is to leave the top 20% out of the solution. And the problem with that, Michael, is if you don't get the top 20% involved, they're not going to have an incentive to push back on spending, which is the ultimate the ultimate solution to this, to this whole thing, is to, is to have pushback on spending, you know, balance revenues with, with spending. But to balance revenues with spending, you've got to you've got to push back on the top twenty percent. So we haven't we haven't gotten to the to the ultimate solutions yet. I think I think what this real what we're really setting up is a lot of focus. The media will continue to focus on Senate finance because you know Bert Stedman's a great source of of of, uh, of quotes and and you know and it, it is the Senate. Um, and so the media will continue to focus on Senate finance, but I think the real action now shifts to the real important action shifts to House Ways and Means, and coming up with a comprehensive uh, solution to uh, to the to the to the fiscal problem that will include right. <clears throat> include in part oil taxes, will include in part uh, uh, some source of revenue, hopefully more equitable than sales taxes, but some source of revenue, and will include some PFD cuts. Uh, as a, as a, and some, sp and then some spending cuts, some spending restraint as and, well, a, and, a spending, and a spending cap and a cut and a, and a, uh, um, and a, uh, protection for the PFD constitutionally, because that's what has to happen, right? I mean, you have to take the, you have to take the PFD out of the picture for them to face the rest of the fiscal reality. So you have to have a spending cap. So it, it cuts caps, the overall spend, but you also have to constitutionalize or protect the PFD or put it in a shell transfer state so that no matter what, that is now off the table and they're forced to look at the overall picture instead of just going to the piggy bank of the PFD over and over and over again. Right. Exactly right. But, but you also need, you also need to focus on, and I, and I don't think the focus is, I don't think we've had near enough focus on this yet. You also need to create incentives for all Alaska families to be pushing back on spending, for all Alaska families to be bearing a part of the burden of, of increased government spending. Um, and and I, th that's just how that's that you create an incentive for them to for them to push back. And and I don't think we've had enough focus on that yet. So yes, it, it is. The overall package includes constitutionalizing the PFD. The overall package includes a spending pack, a spending cap, uh, constitutionalizing a spending cap if 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 that's the if that's the desire. Um, the overall uh, package includes uh, uh, some additional revenue, but but it's got to include it's got that that pushback on overall revenue. That pushback on revenue has got to include the top twenty percent to to create incentives for them to be part of the pushback. Otherwise. Otherwise, you're just going to have continued continued efforts by the top 20 percent who don't feel the burden of 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 of, of increased spending. Who don't feel you don't have to come up with the revenue for increased spending. You're just going to have continued push uh, by the top 20 percent for uh, uh, for continued spending because they don't they don't bear any part of bear any part of the burden. 
So I we're, we're we we've made progress in this sense. We finally got the, the the spring revenue forecast out there. We finally got much more realistic revenue numbers that everybody's dealing with. Uh, we we've got you know we've got some people engaged on looking at uh, revenue. We've got we've already had some people engaged on looking at spending caps. We've already got some bills in that constitutionalize uh, the PFD. So we're getting the various pieces together. We're missing one piece, which is creating that incentive for the top 20 percent to push back also. Uh, but we're finally we're finally starting to see the the, the pieces uh, out there uh, uh, coming together. And I think it's going to be I don't think you're going to see Senate finance do it. I mean, Lyman's got this idea of cutting the POMB 2575, cutting the PO, PO, the PFD to POMB 2575. And then refilling that, you know, filling it back up to POMB 5050 by by new revenues. But once you get once you get to I don't I don't think that works. Once you get to POMB, once you get the PFD cut to POMB 2575, I don't think there's any real incentive yeah. to, pa- to pass additional revenues. They've got all the revenues they need. Right. It doesn't it does. It's it's so much easier to prevent it than it is to try and ratchet it back. There's no way you're going to tr- you're going to crank it back to 50 50 at that point, because, as you say, there's no incentive for them to do so. So I think I think I think I think the I don't I don't think you're going to see Senate finance come up with the with the comprehensive solution. They'll talk a good game. The media will cover it a lot. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see Senate finance uh, come up with the with the comprehensive solution. I think I think this really puts the spotlight for those who understand, for those who are seeing how this is playing out in the various bodies, I think it really puts the spotlight on uh, on ways and means, um, and hopefully ways and means is going to is going to shine in the spotlight uh, and come up with an with an overall plan. The pieces are the pieces are sort of getting getting formed out there, sort of coming or, or sort of coming to the table out there, but it's putting it together and then getting that one additional missing piece. Uh, as part of the as part of the puzzle to bring it all together. This again, this pretty much covers all the points that the fiscal policy working group brought forward. We just kind of ran, ran through them, uh, basically. Uh, but this is what they're looking for, and that's what the that's what uh, Carpenter and the, and the Ways and Means Committee is trying to create is a sound fiscal plan. It seems like all we're seeing coming out of the Senate Finance Committee is business as usual, more of the same. Right? I mean, it's just. It's from one from one crisis to the next. It's one year at a time. Yeah, and what and what's really going on in Senate Finance is the same thing we saw at the last at the end of last session. Uh, at the end of last session, we saw a, a need for additional revenues. We saw people trying to defend the PFD and protect against PFD cuts. And you'll recall at the end of the last session, uh, 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 Senator Ste- or, uh, Chairman Stedman and Senator Hoffman. Both all of a sudden brought up oil taxes. Uh, they both brought Wilikowski's oil tax up, and what that did was trigger a flash pushback by the chambers of commerce and by all the trade groups. Oh no, you can't increase oil taxes, and that locked in being able to use PFD cuts. I mean, the people who were pushing for right. uh, uh, trying to defend the PFD sort of got silenced at that point because they made the choice between increased oil taxes or 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 PFD cuts. Um, and that's sort of what the Senate's doing again. I mean, we're going to see they're going to have the oil tax bill up on Friday and we're going to see a lot of pushback about the by the oil industry. Uh, I, I, I imagine uh, I would forecast we're going to see a lot of pushback by the oil industry on on the oil tax bill. And they're and the Senate finance is trying to make it about PFD cuts or Senate finance. I mean, Senate finance is going to or, or oil taxes, oil ta- Senate finance is going to say, well, if we can't do oil taxes. We're going to have to do PFD cuts. That's why the burden is really over on House Ways and Means right. to bring all the component parts together. Senate Finance is, is just not is just not doing that, um, and um, and they want to make it you know they, yeah, they, they want look, they want to just create a rationalization for why it needs to be deeper. Well, they're deeper looking deeper. for political cover. I mean, that's what the chambers gave them last year was the political cover to basically make that argument and say PFD cuts or oil taxes. Now you've looked and you and I have discussed that, you know, there is still money on the table in the oil industry. Sure. And you've looked at Wilikowski's bill. I think it's pretty reasonable, quite honestly, looking at it and looking at the components of it. It does the one thing that you've talked about, the Hill Corp uh, thing, you know, uh, uh, that taxation. And again, it makes them, you know, write off their oil tax credits in the areas against uh, investments in the areas. And then it reduces the per barrel and does it. I mean, 
and it could generate four or five hundred million dollars, which I think, as you stated, is probably somewhere in the area of where we could, you know, what is reasonable to continue to tax. So does it does it check off all the boxes for you? I, th- I think I think the 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 Hillcorp fixing the Hillcorp uh, uh, glitch or the Hillcorp loophole I think is important. We should have done that a long time ago. Uh, I think the per barrel changing the per barrel credits is appropriate. Uh, Department of Revenue has looked at that and they've not projected any uh, production losses, any investment losses as a result of of the adjustment to the per barrel credit that that Wilkowski has in there. Ring fence, ring fencing, I think, is going to be a big issue. And I suspect that what Conoco is going to come in and say is that Willow, uh, the, the profitability of Willow gets sort of spacey uh, if you don't do ring fencing, that, that they've factored in, that they factored in the absence of ring fencing, the ability to write off those costs against other production, uh, against other taxes, that they factor that in the economics of Willow. And I suspect we're going to hear statements like, we finally get it to the through the federal government, and now the, the legislature is going to threaten uh, Willow. So I, ring ring fencing may be a may be a step beyond, but the but fixing the Hillcorp glitch, um, the Hillcorp loophole, and and changing uh, uh, per barrel credits, I think are uh, are very appropriate steps. And that is four hundred to five hundred million dollars. One of the few things that Harold and I agree on: Alaska is the only oil sovereign with a net profits tax. I've always wondered. I mean, the whole net profits scheme is such a crazy thing because. I guarantee you all those uh, oil companies have whole floors in a building full of lawyers and accountants that can sharp pencil that stuff down for a net profit deal um, that make it super sketchy. And well, then you've really got a certain number of years to uh, to go back and look at it and everything else. It's always been a problem. Yeah, Alaska is not the oil, only oil sovereign. I mean, Alaska is the only state that has a net profits tax. But but the net profits tax is the standard in the international, among international uh, uh, in the international oil community. So you look at most international venues; they do have net profits tax, um, and that's to encourage investment. I mean, the reason you have a net profits tax is because it takes into account it allows deductibility of of, of additional investment, and it encourages a net profits tax encourages additional investment. So. Uh, it, I, I don't think the problem is with, uh, with, is with the net profits tax. I think the, the problem is, is that we haven't kept up since 2013. We haven't kept up with changes in the economics of, of the oil industry. And we haven't gone back and looked at the various parts that got enacted as part of the overall bill back in 2013 and it updated, updated the bill. And one of the places we can do that is the per barrel credits. And one of the places we need to do that is with respect to the the glitch that Hillcorp found, which is uh, if you if you run your business through an LLC as opposed to a, 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 a corporation, a C corp, uh, then then you don't have to pay corporate tax. So I, I we, we need to fix that glitch and we need to fix the per barrel credits. But I don't think the fundamental problem is with a net, net profits tax. We the the reason we went to part of the reason we went to a net profits tax is is because we want to encourage investment in Alaska. And that's the reason you see a net profits tax uh, th- uh, throughout the world as well, because they want to in- incentivize investment. Well, but we've seen uh, we've seen it in the past. When I was on the borough assembly, we had this all the time where uh, they'd be looking back and, and uh, they, again, had a whole floor full of sharp penciled accountants and lawyers who were basically saying, well, this is what our this is what our tax payment should be. This is where we're at. And then the state has, you know, they got to play catch up and try and do it. And a lot of the times they'd come back and say, no, no, you actually owe this. And they'd catch a few of them. But for the most part, the statute would run out before they got a chance to review a lot of that stuff. And, you know, Alaska's left holding the bag for millions of dollars because they can't keep up with the net profit. I understand the idea of a net profit, uh, a net profit, uh, generating more um, more investment and stuff up front, but once you get to legacy fields and stuff, I think some of that stuff needs to change. Yeah, but there's still investment going on in, in the legacy fields. I mean, this had the change the net profits tax was something that was looked at heavily by the legislature from sort of the mid 2000s. I mean, Aces was a net profits tax. I uh, it, it was something that the legislature has grappled with with for a long time um, in terms of in terms of trying to deal with um, uh, how to encourage investment in, in Alaska. Alaska, unlike Texas and unlike the lower 48, Alaska is, is a challenging environment, uh, challenging uh, uh, climate, challenging environment 
in, in a high cost environment in order to bring additional investment. And so the, the, the evaluation from Tony Knowles on, the evaluation has been, we need to move to a net profits tax in order to encourage investment. I, I grant you that, that it's more complicated. I grant you that you need, that you need more auditors, you need uh, uh, sharper, sharper focus on it. But there's a reason. I mean, it's not, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the old companies wanted it because they have sharp accountants. There's a reason why we moved uh, to a net profits tax, a reason from the state standpoint, why we moved to a net profits tax. So I, we, we need, we need to adjust the net profits tax. I, I'm not arguing with that. And, and, and the Department of Revenue has outlined ways to do it. Well, Lukowski's picked up on those ways. Um, uh, and ring fencing is going to be another issue, but I don't think the fund we don't, I don't think we need to go back and re-challenge the fundamental decision to go to a net profits tax. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, I loved in a lot of these articles that we were talking about and all these new revenue measures and everything else, how all of a sudden everybody has whipped out the term regressive, the regressive <laughs> tax. Uh, you know, the, in the two or three articles that talk about Ben Carpenter's deal and they're going on and on and on about how, oh, man, it's a regressive tax. Uh, we should, you know, uh, all of a sudden they've discovered that word and never, of course, applied it to the PFD. Well, I, I broke out in laughter yesterday. I was reading some of the, the Twitter, the tweets on uh, on the sales tax and Harriet Drummond uh, just had the classic. Harriet Drummond went on and on about how you know, sales tax is regressive and Ben doesn't have exemptions in there and it's even more regressive and and and, and he's trying to pile on this this cost on lowering. Harriet voted for PFD cuts, which are which are miles more regressive than than sales taxes. I, sales taxes aren't good because they don't incentivize the tw top 20 percent to come to the game. But but sales taxes are at least less regressive than than PFD cuts. 30 seconds for a number two tease. Give me a tease on number two. Number two is uh, at the same time as we have, as we have all these knee jerk reactions of, of, uh, of increasing regressivity, we now have through additional PFD cuts, we now have uh, some evidence forming out there that Alaskans are in fact hurting. Uh, and, 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 and the disconnect between that evidence and what's going on on the fiscal side uh, is still pretty stark, and, and we're going to talk about that disconnect. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley is with us, the weekly top three. We're on to number two, which is all of a sudden people are noticing that Alaskans may be hurting. I mean, shocking, I know. Uh, outflow of working age adults, the whole housing issue, the fact that the pandemic, the recession, the blah, blah, all of a sudden they're like, wow, maybe people are hurting out there. And uh, Brad, you have comments on it. Well, there are two articles that that as 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 you're reading all these articles about PFD about you know we need to cut the PFD. You're reading all this Stedman, all the Senate Finance stuff about we need to cut the PFD in order to balance the budget, and lack of recognition about what that means for Alaska families. It's just sort of you know I need more money, so I'm going to go I'm going to go grab some of that money that's going through my fingers on the way to Alaska families. Uh, as I was reading those articles and, and listening to that, the, the, those hearings, I, I'm, I'm going through some of the other articles in the, in the paper, financial articles in the paper, papers, and two caught my attention. One was in the Frontiersman, uh, excellent article on uh, credit card uh, debt. Alaskans have the highest credit card debt per capita uh, in the nation, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in all 50 states. Um, and the article talks about the burden and, and why credit card debt is such a bad debt in terms of its cost, in terms of the interest expense, and, and, and in terms of you know not not really letting you get out of the hole. Uh, sort of credit card debt sort of puts you in a death spiral. And how bad all that is. And Alaskans have the highest credit card debt in the nation. Alaska families have the highest credit card debt in the nation. It ain't going to be the top twenty percent that have high credit card debt. It's going right. to be the middle and lower income Alaska families have the highest credit card debt uh, in the nation. And, and, the, and the disconnect between what I'm hearing on one side about, we just need to take more and more and more and more money out of the PFD, you know, cut the PFD even deeper is justified because government needs more. The disconnect between hearing that on one side and knowing how regressive those cuts are and what they do, how much money that's taking out of Alaska fam the hands of Alaska families. 
And then hearing on the other side that Alaska families are running up the highest credit card debt in the nation uh, per capita was just sort of, you know, just my my brain just sort of was was running back and forth. Alaskans are hurting. You don't you're not using credit card debt if you're if you're not hurting. You don't you don't maintain high credit card balances if you're not hurting. Um, that's sort of that's sort of your 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 source of income or your sor- source of revenue. It's not income. Source of revenue of last resort to use to use credit card debt. And if Alaskans are running the highest credit card debt in the nation, that means Alaskans are hurting. And 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 on the one hand for for the, the di- it's just a stark disconnect. On the one hand, going, we can just take more and more and more out of Alaska families through deeper PFD cuts. And at the same time, hearing high credit card debt is just, just astounding. The second article was in the Juno Empire, and it's an op-ed, amazingly enough, uh, by Angela Rodell that talks about, you know, part of the solution to Alaska's out-migration is to help bolster Alaska's small business. And to get small business off the ground, to build more small businesses, because that that builds a better community, it builds more employment, it creates more opportunity, it keeps more people here if they're tied to their if they're tied to their small business. And Alaska needs to encourage small business. Well, guess what? Guess what encourages small business? It's capital formation. And and I I've, I've got a couple of friends who have who have 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 kept their PFDs, have built them up as a nest egg. And are using them now to finance their their efforts uh, as small businesses, home businesses, uh, small shops, um, uh, small Etsy businesses, small online businesses. Right. And they're and they're being financed not by banks, but by you know equity coming out of their PFD. And at the same time, to read that article about we need more of this, we need more small businesses. At the same time as you're hearing, and hey, we need deeper PFD cuts. What we're doing, I mean, Rob Myers has got this exactly right. What we're doing is Alaskans have problems. We have problems with with, uh, private debt. Families have problems with private debt through credit cards. We have problems in capital formation to to finance small businesses, equity formation to finance small businesses. And and, and now we're taking all those resources that could do that through the PFD. We're taking them and shifting them to government. Right. And so and so we're creating a situation in which to get out of the hole, Alaskans are having to come to government. I mean, Ala- the next thing we're going to hear is, oh, we need we need to finance those people who have big credit card debt or we need to finance. You know, we need to have a, a bank for 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 for, you know, to finance small businesses. We don't need that. We need to let the people have their money. Right. Well, the, the, other, the other thing she mentioned in there is a loosening of restrictions and zoning and some other things. I mean, that's, again, part of the problem is government is in the way. We, there's a whole article out about uh, occupational licensing right now, about how far behind we are in the state of Alaska and things like that. I mean, small business is what drives, it's the economic engine of the state. I mean, yes, you know, big corporations, they hire a lot of people, but it is the small business. 80% are in small business. That's that's 80% of the economy. If we could reduce the regulations, the strictures, the zoning and all this other kind of stuff, this is where we need to go. And instead, we're just adding more and more. Uh, I mean, government is growing, right? I mean, that's the, that's the whole problem. But small business also needs capital formation. Small business also needs people having access to capital. You can't, you can't get 100% loan for a small business. I mean, you can't finance it entirely with debt. Small business needs capital formation in order to capital, in order to, in order to form those businesses. And, and, and the other article is telling us they're already tapping out, that Alaskans are tapping out their credit cards and right. the highest credit card debt per capita in the nation. So they're not going to be able to, to finance it through, through additional credit card debt. We're already, we're already hitting the, the ceiling there. So where does that come from? It comes from letting you have access to your money, what, this, what the PFD set up, what the statute sets up as your money so that you can, so that you have money to cash flow income in order to pay down the credit card debt so you have cash flow money in order to have capital formation for the small businesses and we're we're just right we 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 see the problems and yet we and, and yet we're we're making them worse uh right. government's making them worse yeah how much credit card debt is paid off every year with a pfd I mean, right? I mean, there's so many things that could help that that kind of stuff out. It immediately is submarine by uh, 
um, by Lyman Hoffman, who comes back and is like, I don't believe that only people of Alaska should be hit by a $1.3 billion reduction in dividends. I think we should consider other options. Meanwhile, you're the one that's producing and providing and, and posing the 75-25 split. Uh, I mean, come on, Lyman. I mean, seriously. You know, you want to talk about regressive and hitting Alaskans hard, especially Alaskans in your own backyard. That is just insanity. It is. It is. You know, I, Bryce Edmund, Edgman yesterday in, in House Finance had a comment that I just I was stunned by. Uh, Bryce said that, you know, the PFD isn't that important to rural Alaska, to Bush Alaska, because, among other things, they have, you know, uh, 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 Native Corp dividends that uh, that provide them income. Wait a second. A, not all Bush Alaskans are natives. So not all Bush Alaskans right. have, have Native Corp dividends. B, that's supposed to be additional. So, so you're justifying taking money away from 80% of Alaska families using the tool that has the largest adverse impact on 80% of Alaska families, middle and lower income Alaska families, because some Alaska families get Native Corp uh, dividends. That, that's just, I mean, the, the, the disconnect between, yeah, some of my people are okay, are better off or are okay because they still get Native Corp dividends. So we, we can take the PFD away from them. Some of my people are better off, but you know, the rest of Alaskans are, are worse off, but yeah, don't worry about that because, because, you know, right. people, it's a people I care about are, 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 are a little bit better off are are a little bit balanced because of the Native Corp dividends. It's just, we, we got really odd reactions out there, but at the same time, at the same time, we've got articles that are telling us that Alaskans can use money. That we've got, I mean, that Alaska is expensive, shocker. That, that, that our credit card debt is the highest in the nation, shocker, because we're dealing with high costs. Um, and that we need capital to, to, we need small businesses. So we need capital to help in the formation of small businesses, shocker. And, you, and we got all that, all that evidence, you know, uh, staring us in the face all those comments staring us in the face. And then we're, and then on the other hand, we're saying, oh, but we'll just take more and more, more, more and more money away from them because government needs more money. That's just, I, the, you know, last week we were talking about the disconnect between everybody talking about increased spending and nobody talking about the revenue, right? Uh, the, the side of it. Well, we finally got that disconnect solved with the, with the spring revenue forecast coming out. Now we got this huge friggin' dig, de, disconnect developing between the situation facing Alaska families and Alaska small business and what and what government's doing now. Yeah, and and that's the thing. I mean, slowly but surely each one of these events is opening the eyes up of people more and more. I mean, it's willful blindness. It's not like they didn't know, it's just that they didn't want to admit it. Uh this has been the problem for years that I've said in this state. It's not like they can't see it coming. It's like they're storks, you know, sticking their their ostriches sticking their head in the sand and just saying la 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 la, I can't see it, I can't see it. We'll just keep spending and we'll just draw it from savings and it'll be the way it is. I mean, this is no shock to anybody who's been watching state government for any time in the last 20 years. Uh it's just now that they are, you know, they finally run out of road to kick the can down is the problem. They're up against they're coming up against the wall and a can's just going to bounce right back at them. So that's what they're facing right now. And the ones they're trying to protect. I mean, I, I I'm sure it's not a popular comment. I'm sure the chat room will go ballistic, but if the ones they're trying to protect when when you get down to it at the end of the day, the ones they're trying to protect is the top 20%. Because because when we talk about revenues, it's either deeper PFD cuts or in, or in Ben's case it's a sales tax, also regressive. Uh, has a limited impact on the top 20% um, uh, or, or, or oil taxes. We're going to take it out of the hides of the oil companies. Uh, that's, and, and it's just, I mean, for somebody who understands pots of revenue and where revenue comes from, it's just so clear that they're, that they're creating this exception. So we'll see. I mean, that's, that's sort of the last bastion. That's where all the, all the defensive walls are, are put up. Uh, but that's that's one that's one that needs to be knocked down. If we're ever going to get spending under under control, uh, that's one that needs to be knocked down as well. All right. Finally, you're saying in number three that the media is getting it. Maybe. Well, let's not get let's not get Maybe. too carried away. <laughs> Starting to get it. Maybe they're getting it. Maybe. Go ahead. Well, so James Brooks, who we've who I've talked about on the show, is as you know, leaving things out about the PFD. I was, I think it was last week or the week before, I was complaining about, you know, he had an article on the PFD and he didn't mention once the PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on 80% of Alaska families, had the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy, had the largest, largest adverse impact on Alaska jobs. So he didn't mention that. 
James Brooks in, in the article talking about the new revenue measures, talking about uh, uh, oil taxes and talking about briefly talking about sales taxes. He said this, some lawmakers are wary of going low on the dividend, additional PFD cuts, because dividend redu reductions act as a regressive tax because all Alaskans receive the same benefit, be dividend. It comprises a higher share of poor Alaskans' incomes. So reduction in its amount is a bigger hit to them. Regressive tax. That's the first time I think I've seen James use, the, use that term, make that recognition that PFD cuts are a regressive tax. And it may be the first time I've seen it anywhere um, uh, in Alaska media. I think Matt Buxton in the Midnight Sun blog talked about it a couple of times. But but this is there. At least there is the faint recognition of, of the fact that PFD cuts are, are not just government's money that government's keeping. They do, in fact, operate as a regressive tax on Alaska families. And I want to encourage that sort of recognition by mentioning it. Uh, uh, on the show, that it's not that the media is not always bad, or ninety percent bad. I mean, the Ala at the same time as James published that, the Alaska Daily News had, or the Anchorage Daily News had yet another op-ed from the Binkley top twenty percent about you know how bad how bad PFDs are and how we need to cut them and how that's it, how we need to finance government. I mean, they're, they're just they're just bought in on the whole top twenty percent position. But but having this recognition that it's a regressive tax, uh, I think, is something that uh, that's encouraging. Uh, and hopefully we'll see more of it as we as we get deeper into the fiscal discussion. Well, <clears throat> at least it's uh, intellectually honest at that point. Uh, you know, for the first time, they're actually looking at both sides of the story, which I thought was what they were supposed to be doing from the beginning. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought that was supposed to be. But again, this idea that somehow all of a sudden everybody's discovered the phrase aggressive tax, uh, applying it only to the sales tax, not to the PFD cuts, I find the most hypocritical thing that I could possibly think of. Brad, what are you watching for this week <clears throat> as we go forward here? What are you uh, what are you keeping your eyes on? Uh, the Friday hearing on oil taxes will be a big one. Um, how the oil camp, how the oil companies play with it, what the chambers of commerce do, um, uh, whether uh, whether how strongly they uh, they push back on it. Um, it. It'll be I mean, they're they're the Senate's trying to set it up as PFD cuts versus oil taxes. So we'll see how they, uh, how they play that. And then Ben's committee, what's going on. I mean, this is sort of a continuing thing, but what's going on in ways and means and is ways and means truly going to put all the, going to be able to bring all of the pieces together, including a, a, a piece that brings the top 20% involves the top 20% brings all that together in a package and how that, uh, how that progresses. Cause ways and means is going to be looking over the sales tax bill tomorrow night, Wednesday night. So Wednesday for that, Friday for the oil tax bill, you'll be listening to that. And uh, I guess we'll see what happens. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, final thoughts, final parting words before I let you go. Well, we're, we're making progress. We finally got recognition between the, of the disconnect between how much we're spending and, and how much uh, revenue we have. We finally uh, took that step this week. Now we've got to get into the disconnect between what's going on with Alaska families and Alaska small business and what we're doing, what we're doing on government. I mean, government is, is working against Alaska families and working against Alaska small business by taking money that's otherwise due them. Um, and the, 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 the middle and lower income Alaska families otherwise do them and, and shoving it over to government, taxing them to, to, to pay for government. Uh, we got to get that disconnect resolved as well. Brad Keithley. Uh, thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board. And, Michael, as uh, always, thanks for having me. We'll talk to you next week. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.